Hi everybody, welcome to the Tidewater Classical Guitar 2020 fall season, all virtual. Um, we are so grateful that we're able to be here tonight uh, presenting this concert to you. If you had told us in March we would be here, um, I don't know we would have agreed. So it's fantastic that we're able to do this, able to bring you um, a live concert here. Thank you so much to the Jewish Museum and Cultural Center, where we are, for hosting us. It's a great venue. We had a chance to do some concerts here this summer and we thought, why not come back? They were so nice to us. Also, thank you so much to my board of directors here at Tidewater Classical Guitar. Everybody's put in so much work. This is completely impossible without all of them. Um, in particularly, Brad and Joni Perry who have done so much work in helping getting this live stream going and getting the website functionality together for the RSVP function. We have other concerts coming up soon. October 10th, we'll be live streaming Brendan Evans from Massachusetts, fantastic guitarist, longtime friend of mine, really has the it factor, super expressive musician. I can't wait to hear him play. We'll have Adam Kostler on November 7th, who you might have uh, saw with his brother, the Kostler duo, John Kostler, perform at one of our fundraiser events, um, Close Encounters, last October. We're going to have Adam here solo. Uh, what can I say about Adam? He's a prodigy. He's one of the best. He was born with a guitar in his hand. The guy can play. So don't miss that on November 7th. And then lastly, on November 21st, we're going to make good on our concert that we postponed from March um, when everything kind of exploded. It was actually the first week where um, we knew things were different. March 20th, she was supposed to be here. So Meng Su is going to be here November 21st, and we're going to live stream her and have a Q&A with her at the end as well. So I'd like to ask you as well, um, you can go over to Tidewater Classical Guitar, you can make a donation if you'd like because these concerts are presented to you absolutely free. Please, if you'd like to make a donation, every little bit helps a small organization like ours. We really appreciate it and we really love to see everybody here. So enough of this stuff. Tonight we have Matt Thomas, steel string fingerstyle guitar virtuoso. I met Matt about two years ago at one of our events in the lobby and got to know him very well just through conversations there and got to know his playing and I knew from that moment we were going to have to have him play a concert for us. We had had him play in the showcase concert and as soon as I knew we were going to be live streaming it came to mind that I'd like to open our season with Matt Thomas. Um, he writes all his own compositions. They're crazy good. He's won numerous competitions um, and placed in several others. He's a Tidewater native. He lives in Virginia Beach. He was born in Newport News, so we are lucky to call him our own. So without any further ado, I'd like to welcome to the stage, Matt Thomas.
tuning in, guys. That was a tune of mine called A Dreamer's Lullaby, and that was played on a harp guitar. For those of you that got questions about that, stick around till the end, and we'll have a good conversation about it. So the next tune I'm going to play is actually one that I tried to write a continuation piece, if you will. So there's a musician named Stephen Bennett. And if you haven't heard of this guy, you need to check him out. Um, he wrote this tune called The Eye of God right when the Hubble telescope had been unveiled. And it was really the first time we'd been able to see that far out into space. Well, just a few years ago, they unveiled the James Webb telescope, which was over 10 times more powerful. So I got to thinking, what if? You know, you always see those, those shots and screenshots where they shoot out into the stars. But what if we could actually do the exact opposite and go from those stars right and fall back to the spot right here. And this is one that I wrote and tried to do a continuation piece, if you will. Uh, and this is called A Fall from the Stars. <coughs>
So I figured that I'd switch over to the guitar and not put everybody to sleep for the evening. Uh, I've got a lot more harp guitar material if you'd like to check that out. Uh, but for now, I've got some six string things to deal with. So I want to send this first tune out um, to a very dear friend of mine and mentor, Mr. John Boyles. Um, he was going to be here tonight, but unfortunately, he's feeling a little under the weather and decided not to come. Thanks for that. But uh, I know you're listening, so we're going to do this one for you. Um, this is a tune of mine. Uh, actually, the majority of tonight will be my tunes. Um, but this is written in Dadgad tuning. Uh, for those of you that don't know Dadgad, that's D-A-G, or D-A-D-G-A-D. Um, and it's got a really beautiful Celtic sense to it. Uh, the lack of third can be great for writing. Um, so I decided to tap into my Irish roots a bit, and I didn't realize that I had any Irish roots at all until I tried to grow a beard. There was this praise of No Shave November a few years ago, and I grew it out and realized I have a giant red beard. I'm blind. Where did this come from? So I decided to go to the internet and figured it out. It's due to incomplete dominant recessive traits. That's not gonna fit on the back of the CD. So <laughs> I took the liberty of shortening it, and this is a tune that I wrote called Incomplete Dominant Traits. Hope you enjoy.
So <clears throat> just a few years ago, I thought that if I was going to record my music, it needed to be done right. Um, I kind of grew up listening to Stephen Bennett and this guy named Tommy Emmanuel. I'm sure you guys have probably heard of Tommy Emmanuel. Uh, but if you haven't, go check him out. <laughs> um, but in doing some research, I found that all these people have recorded with the same person. Um, and it was this lady, Kim Person, out of Yorktown, Virginia. So I, we were on the last day of recording my album, and we had just finished up, and I rushed home. And uh, it was probably 2 o'clock in the morning at this point. And I was exhausted, and we went to let our 16-year-old blue healer out to go to the bathroom. And he immediately came right back, and just collapsed, and he didn't get up again. Um, we had to make the decision that night, and right then, actually, to, to put him down. And I couldn't really make sense of what to even do at that point. So uh, I did what I know to do best. I, I rushed to the instrument, and this tune came right out. So I called up Kim the very next morning and, and played it for her over the phone. She said, Matt, get over here. Let's record that. So it's actually the last tune on my album. It was originally on harp guitar, but I've since uh, rearranged it for guitar because the harp can't always come to every gig, and I wanted to make sure I play this tune. So here's one for all the, the dog lovers. This is called Sky's Eyes.
So those first two tunes were not in standard tuning, they were in dadgad tuning. And now we've changed, uh, we took our second string up to C. It's kind of risky at times, but I keep a light gauge on it, so not to offset too much tension. Um, I had mentioned a lady earlier named Kim Person, and when I had uh, had the opportunity to record my album with her, I didn't realize that it was going to turn into so much more than just recording music. Um, the guidance that she's able to give music musicians is unreal. Um, I've always had a, a self-confidence issue, so immediately getting in there, she could hear that I was a little nervous, and she'd you know, pause me and tell me a, an uplifting story about you know, one of my idols, Tommy or Steven or something like that, and right in the middle, she'd interject, oh, and by the way, you can too. I was genuinely confused. But that behavior and her constantly saying, oh, and by the way, you can too, um, really gave me a new sense of purpose. So I changed a lot of what I was writing and um, I wrote this tune for her. This is called, oh, and by the way, you can too.
That one's a, a rough one to play. Lots of hammer-ons and pull-offs. So um, a lot of the next couple of tunes, or a lot of the techniques that are used in the next couple of tunes, I didn't think we're going to work for some of these applications. Um, and that tune in particular was one of them. But I, I had that voice in my head, oh, by the way, you can too. So don't ever doubt yourself. And try to aim for the stars. Um, so I'm really influenced by classical music. Um, and people ask me why I write the way that I do, and it's kind of the way I was raised. I, I was brought up in, in classical music and was taught by John Boyle's music theory and the importance of that kind of stuff. It, it really is a backbone. Um, it doesn't have to be you know, your stance in life to be a, you know, uh, perfect music theory musician. But using those elements can really elevate your music. So I decided to kind of go back to one of the, the first tunes that I fell in love with um, in marching band at Woodside High School. We played Gustav Holt's Jupiter, and that was really eye-opening in, in how harmonies can play with each other. So I decided to incorporate it as the ballad piece, at least just to the opening of the song. This is one um, that I title Titan, and it's for one of Jupiter's moons that actually has liquid in it. So this is part of the um, Sweet from the Deep series that I'll be doing in my next album. So I'm gonna get into this open C tuning real quick. <laughs>
So in being stuck, not being able to travel, sometimes you have to search for different outlets to write songs. Um, I've always been really inspired by traveling and seeing sights and going, oh, well, I have an experience. Now I can write something about it. Um, so I've had to find new ways. And new science can really get the gears turning. So I was reading off the coast of Australia. They found a community of octopi that have built a city together. I'm not kidding you. They found different shells and rubble that they could find built a city, and then they develop social levels within that community. If one of the octopi does something that doesn't like, they kick him out. What? So they decided to name that city Atlantis. And then they started looking around. They found an even bigger city about 40 miles from there. So they named that one Octolopolis. And it got me thinking, what if? What if there was one giant kingdom down low? And there was one giant cephalopod waiting for all these humans to piddle out. And then he's going to come up here and just <laughs> smash down all these weird concrete structures and take over this planet once and for all. So I know that's a bit of a crazy story, but it could be true. So I wrote that future king of tune, and this is one that I titled The King of the Cephalopods. And if you're wondering, this is still on that open C tune. Thank you. 
in time for that. So as you might be able to tell, there's a main street right outside those walls. But man, what a beautiful venue this is. Thank you again to the Jewish Museum and Cultural Arts Center. And uh, again, thanks to Tidewater Classical Guitar for having me. Um, but we'll get into more things in a row. We're going to get into some, uh, some sad stuff now. Um, there's a wonderful documentary on Netflix called Chasing Coral. And it actually documents a lot of the coral reef bleaching that's happening around the world, but it actually kind of focuses on the Great Barrier Reef and the death of it. Um, but in the last month before the reef really quit trying to regenerate, it did something really unique. For hundreds of miles, it was glowing at an unprecedented rate, and it looked like a giant psychedelic party. Even during the daytime, you can see the coral glowing out of the water. There's some beautiful imagery in the documentary. Make sure you go watch it. But I just kind of had to sit there in, in silence afterwards and go, well, what do we do now? So what do I do? I do what I know best. I run to this thing. Um, and I decided I needed to try to capture the symbolism of the reef, um, the different life between it. And sometimes they use that in school to kind of explain symbiosis between different organisms. So I decided, well, let me see if I can come up with a, a way of explaining that in just a few notes. So I tuned the guitar drastically different. This is a, an open G minor tuning with a four on the bass. So you got your C in the bass, but you don't play out of the one position. For those of you your guitar players, the rest of you, that's just gibberish. So I, decided let's try to capture what the reef life sounds like. And this is a tune that I titled The Great Bleached Reef. Thank you. 
right. So it looks like that I've got about enough time to do one more for you guys. So I want to send a big thank you out again to Tidewater Classical Guitar for having me in this wonderful concert series. And um, thanks to all of you for listening. And thanks for this elite crew that showed up for the end performance. Thank you, guys. It means a lot to me. Um, so there's a guy from Italy named Luca Striganoli. And he's an absolute monster. He's terrifying. He does everything that you want to do on the guitar and more. Everything I don't want to do, I want to do it because he does it. He's one of those players. It's lovely. So uh, in my head, I thought, oh, well, that's my nemesis. And so I wrote this tune called The Nemesis. And it took me a year of playing it to realize that the title and the name of the song has nothing to do with him. It has everything to do with me and me being my own nemesis. And you tend to be your own worst enemy. You tend to doubt your own self. And this is just another example of I doubted myself and then I came up with this tune. I can't always play it. I'm going to try real hard. Um, but every now and then, I can just nail it, and it, it feels great. So I, I used this one as my competition closer this past year for the uh, international uh, fingerstyle competition in Arkansas. And uh, this actually won me the competition. So um, I hope I can get it as nice as I did then. If not, uh, we won't talk about that. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so this is uh, it's a really interesting tuning. It's uh, C, G, C, G, C. E flat. So it's a lot of C's and G's. So really, it's quite interesting trying to f make your harmonic structure within it because of that. So um, try it out sometimes. It's, it's real fun, guys. Uh, wouldn't lead you in the wrong direction. But we're going to get in the tuning first. Give me a second.
said that he was going to open it up for some questions. Sure, yeah. Wow, man. Fantastic. Like, this is an incredible concert. Really, we're privileged. We love having you here and opening up the concert like this with the, with the real big man. It was a fantastic performance. Thank you for having me. Of course. So we're, we're waiting for the live stream to finish up. We got a lot of comments, though, a lot of people loving what's going on here. Um, Norman Sirocco from the Jewish Museum and Cultural Center was so excited. We were playing. Um, said you uh, had a great performance. Um, let me find some of the comments as we went through here. Jeff Pike said um, one of his favorites, I think he was talking about incomplete dominant traits. You got a oh, cool. shout out here from John Boyles. He said... A dominant performance, I'd say. Really <laughs> sounds good. Thanks for the shout out. So. Oh, but I, how could I not shout out to John Boyce? He's a man. I think you requested that tune the other day when we were on the, the yeah. Zoom open mic, too. So that's definitely a crowd favorite. Um, Patrick Louis says, nice. Norman says, you're fantastic. Jeff Pike, killer. He said, his, Jeff Pike says his hand would have fallen off. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff Pike is actually a harp guitar player. Thanks for listening, Jeff. So let's see. People are coming in with some comments. Um, Jeff Pike says, Matt writes such powerful songs, great music. It really is. I think um, we ha it looks like we have some encores. <laughs> John says, encore already. Thomas Bozek says, wow. Jeff Pike says, encore. Delia Moulton, amazing. Yeah, so. An encore? Do we have an encore? Let's do an encore, yeah, and then we can move on to the Q&A after that. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll slow it down. And I, I did this and sound check and it seemed like everybody was kind of driven along with it. I don't always like to do covers, but here's a little mashup for you. This is uh, I Want You Back and don't worry, be happy. <laughs>
right. Fantastic, Matt. Um, so, yeah, we have a couple questions coming in. Yeah, fire away. So you probably never get this one, but Jason would like you to explain what the harp guitar is. This is a good one. I've never heard this one. <laughs> no, not that strange instrument. Um, so let me, um, let me put this thing on. So the harp guitar is very similar to the guitar in that you have six string bank that's the same. I don't ever really defer from standard tuning on this bank because um, a lot of times ends up defeating the purpose of the sub basses. Uh, a lot of times we end up tuning lower to get those big deep sounds but then you lose your finger position so I just about always leave the guitar in standard and then the sub basses I have them diatonic starting from a low G, A, B, right now it's B flat, but B, C, D, and then the top one is actually an octave up G that's higher than my lowest E string. It's counterintuitive, but what it allows you to do is form chord structure without having to use your hands. I've got a, a good solid fifth right there, and really, you hit that harmonic, you've got a full chord right there. And that's that first song that I played, it kind of bases around the idea of using that structure. Hope that helps. Yeah, cool. Yeah. So we have some other ones. Yeah, the harp guitar is so cool, man. Do you do you always go diatonic or do you sometimes experiment with well, some the, different the idea of having it diatonic allows you to say uh, we go to the key of C. Now I can take my lowest G down to F and I don't have to change anything else. Now I'm in the key of C. So um, it's nice because you can, just with one sub bass, get to a different key. Very cool. Um, let's see, Matt, Mark Calhoun says, um, no words can describe Matt's talent. Thank you, Matt, for sharing it with us. And then he has a question. He wanted to know what effect you were using on Titan. Um, well, for one, there is on everything that I do with the six string. Um, has a sub bass polyphonic threshold um, pedal. It's really cool. It's called the Boss OC3, and you can essentially set a frequency threshold, and anything below that, it doubles as a sub bass. So it makes it sound like you have a harp guitar, even though you don't. But the stereo effects that you were hearing were the Strymon timeline, and I've got a series of different patches that I actually kind of went through and tweaked out. This one's a really high rate uh, delay, so it ends up sounding like a really long-tailed verb. Okay, yeah, I think John was actually asking about that. John Boyles was saying actually he wants to get a get a short tour of your rig, <laughs> and then he said, with a few that. demos, and um, the long reverb particularly sounds good, which you were just speaking about, and uh, he was wondering if it was on a volume pedal. It sounds very, very good. I have it on expression, so a lot of times you saw me leaning in and out or moving my foot to do things. Yeah. I, I do. I have an expression pedal over here um, so that the delay unit is always computing, um, except for King of the Cephalopods. That's one of the few that I leave the expression full on and actuate what the delay unit is hearing and computing. Um, but for the most part, it just stays on, and anytime I need to uh, widen the room, if you will, or create a foundation for you to do less or sometimes do more. Um, the delay is great because it's also, uh, I should note that all my effects, both the reverb, which I do have reverb as well, um, are all in true stereo. So none of the effects are going to uh, line up or get in the way of my mono guitar signals. Okay, cool. You know, for y'all that are watching too, one of the things you should know is like the rig he has down there probably goes from about the middle of that podium all the way to the right of the screen. So there, there's a lot going on down there. It's a pretty intricate little setup. It's very impressive. It fits in a box and goes on a plane. It's That's modest. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I will call out Alexander Misko, uh, my buddy from Russia. 
his pedal board is much, much larger than mine, and it's always a headache. Uh, we, we had had a big brainstorming thing when I was building this incarnation of it, but there's always an issue when you get on a flight. Um, it's got to be under 50 pounds, and it's got to be within a right. certain size requirement. So this fits both size and weight requirements. Fantastic. It could always be bigger. Yeah. Um, Michael O'Connor, he said... Um, what, what, so, Matt, how about a slow motion example of your six fret chord with a hammer on and pull off with harmonics? Do you know what he's talking about? <laughs> I, I assume maybe he's <laughs> speaking of Nemesis, maybe? Maybe. Um, that's a, a complex one. So Yeah, so example of six fret chord with a hammer on and pull off with harmonics. Yeah, maybe. Let's see. You're going to do something cool anyways, right? <laughs> Maybe so. Was I'm not sure. Were you thinking of that one? Maybe he could let us know if he sees it. Um, he also said, you are really setting the stage for future fingerstyle guitarists. So good. So yeah, everybody loved the performance they're saying. I know that um, there's a lot of wonderful young up-and-coming fingerstyle players that are lighting the fire underneath of all of us. I, I can't even say older fingerstyle players because you know I'm only 34. I've, I've just primarily doing fingerstyle for the past decade, that's all. Um, but you see these kids coming out of the bedrooms that have brilliant ideas. And yeah. keep, please, all of you keep posting those ideas, because I'm watching. Yeah, steal them, you gotta steal them, right? <laughs> well, Chet Atkins had one of my favorite ways of saying it. It's not stealing, it's research. That's right. <laughs> yeah, uh, Michael O'Connor said that was the one he was talking about, yeah. That's the one he was talking that's, about. That's a fun one. And, uh, uh, a, a lot of what makes some of those big stretch chords even possible or feasible, the reason for it, is because of the tuning. It is. It's C, G, C, G, C. So by doing those things like that, you're creating octaves, which create a lot of cool dissonance. Um, sure. Yeah, I had a question about the tuning that I was thinking when you were playing, because you use quite a few different ones. What... What kind of comes first, just like the tuning or the idea, and then you, you the know The idea you need it. always okay. comes first. Um, the tuning ends up making it happen, uh, or at least achieving certain ideas that I have um, that sometimes are not just, they, you can't do them in standard tuning. Certain octaves like that, the getting the power behind it, you can't do, and be able to have open strings to do fun harmonics or Slappy tappy stuff. <laughs> sure. Right. Whatever you, whatever sees fit. Fantastic. Well, I mean, we have tons of Bravo. Everybody really enjoyed the concert. Um, I just want to thank you again for joining us and opening up this season, man. It was lovely to thank have you, you play for, for us. Thank you guys for having me. And really thank all of you for tuning in. And uh, make sure that you tune back in for the future concerts because they're going to be even better. Yeah, <laughs> but no, I don't know about that. Yeah, we'll see everybody on October 10th. So follow Matt on the inter internets, his Facebook, his I know that the YouTube. Matt, there's, there's an army of different Matt Thomases, and it's sometimes difficult to weed through all of them. They might as well just name me John Smith. <laughs> so I made it real easy. It's thematthomas.com. Which one? This one. That one. Oh. The Matt Thomas. Oh, we do have another question from Jeff Pike. We'll stick around. Uh, it looks like you have a DiMarzio Black Angel in your six string. Can you share what other mics and or pickups might be in that one and how yes. much of each one you like to use in your mix? Oh, that's a big question. That's, uh, that's a variable question, actually. So we'll start with the pickups in the six string. The six string has four different outputs, essentially. Um, the mag signal deals with all effects, um, the delays, the octave, stuff like that, because you really want a pinpoint frequency th that is being computed by these devices. Um, so that also helps give you a nice fat treble if you, if you need to make the trebles fatter. It sometimes can be difficult to do that on a transducer or under, under saddle without making it overly bassy, and then you just can't even play the instrument. Um, so I, for my kick drum or percussive type stuff, there is a transducer just right underneath where my palm hits. And that comes out separate 
that goes to its own EQ compression gate, and it's on its own channel. Um, then the backbone of the guitar sound, which I could do a show with just this, is the Fishman Matrix mic combo. Now it's on a TRS out, which what most people don't really do, they just send it out mono. But if you use a tip ring sleeve cable, you can separate them and phase align them properly and get the most out of them. And that's, that's what I end up doing. I use the, the Grace Felix actually has a really cool feature. If you send a TRS cable to it, it splits them for you. So um, that's the guitar sound. Um, and that's that. Cool. Yeah, so that's why we always see you plugging in twice. Right? Plugging yeah. in twice. Right. For the harp, however, um, it also has that same Fishman mic under saddle combo, but then it's got a K and K underneath of the saddle line on the sub bases to okay. connect the dots, if you will. So it doesn't sound like two instruments. It's one instrument. Mm. Um, and the key is that soundboard transducer that connects the dots between the two different bands. That makes sense. Uh, Raul said, thank you for the great concert. What is your usual home setup like? Also, how is your composing, recording, and producing process like? I'm glad you asked that. that um, so a lot of times when you end up just writing things acoustically, you don't know where to put the effects or how they're going to respond, especially with these lower tunings in the six string and that octave pedal. You can create way bad mud if you're not careful. So at first, I was writing everything just with the instrument, just acoustically at home. Um, but it doesn't give you the same plugged in response that other things do. This is a lot to set up at home. And I, I do live with another great guitar player, uh, Dustin Furlow. So we're, we share our music room. So I can't always just leave everything set up. Um, so a way to get that plugged in aspect of playing the guitar without having to have all that. There's this wonderful thing called the Tonewood Amp, and it actually magnet attaches to the back of your guitar and gives you some reverb or delay or whatever you want that could be a great songwriting idea or utensil and allows you to practice without, without having to do all the setup and be tied to your umbilical cords. <laughs> Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I've seen those before. So they're they're really cool. The tone wood amp is it's a it's an inspiring tool. Yeah. Um, I mean, you could just <laughs> sit there and go, oh, so that verb. It's beautiful. Right. It's great algorithms. Right. Fantastic. Well, I think that looks like all the questions we have. So, unless anybody pops up a question, um, again, man, just thank you so much. It was great having the concert and great talking to you about uh, your artistic process and your rig, your practice process regarding the rig at home. It's really insightful, and I'm sure uh, everybody enjoyed that conversation too. Yeah. Well, thank you guys for tuning in and listening. And if you guys have any more questions, feel free to email me, message me on Facebook, Instagram. It's a lot of them. Thank you so much. So everybody, um, we'll see you on October 10th. For Brendan Evans, it'll be the same process. Just go to our website, tidewaterclassicalguitar.org, to RSVP for that concert. Thank you again, Matt. Thank you.